Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. We're going to hear um, from the WHO today, uh, and uh, some of what we're going to hear um, since the Hamas uh, horrific attacks on Israel, um, October um, 7th, more than 10,000 people have been killed, including. 8,500 in Gaza and 1,400 in Israel. In both Israel and Gaza, 70% of those who were killed were women and children. More than 21,000 are injured. There are more than 1.4 million people in Gaza that have been displaced. Conditions, according to the WHO and Dr. Tedros, are simply horrific in in Gaza, and there is a very narrow window for humanitarian efforts. As we're also going to hear from Antonio uh, Guerreras in a press conference that he did um, from the uh, UN floor in New York. Along with that, you know, all these these really horrific conditions, let's bring things back home for a moment, back to Canada, with how things are becoming so expensive, and people are actually suffering to be able to heat their homes, and there's, well, but let's just say this outright, that, that the homeless population in some areas is actually growing because of people not being able to afford their rent. And when I say rent, I also could mean a a mortgage being paid back to the bank that they're being foreclosed on and not because they're not able to keep up with the payments. In either way, the condition and the result is the same people living on the streets we're seeing more and more of that and while we do need to take care of what's happening in gaza understand what is happening in in gaza we also need to stay focused on that so we're going to be hearing from uh, pierre povier about that as he is criticizing the liberal government for uh, the carbon pricing that they're putting to uh, home heating oil in in the winter time, um, it's a condition that is going to cause disaster. So we're going to hear about that also. Um, and I, w- I do want to stress this: there is going to be a quote. Uh, Antonio Guerrero is, is going to talk about a mother nameless mother and she's going to talk about how we all should be outraged over every child that is being killed in Gaza I'm going to extend that I'm going to say we should be outraged over every child that is killed in the war during during, in the world during a conflict we have to get outraged about this because we can't keep allowing militants to indiscriminately d- 
destroy civilian sites. There, there is a UN directive. There are international laws that clearly state that military operations should be conducted on military combatants. Civilian sites should be held exempt. The situation that we had in Gaza where a hospital was struck and hundreds of people were injured or and or killed cannot be allowed to just simply stand and we need to find out who is responsible. We also Let's change that. Maybe we don't need to find out who is responsible. We, we need to hold all all of those uh, uh, military combatants that are in the area responsible for it. On either side. Because the condition of the fighting is what caused that hospital be, to be struck. It is the condition of the fighting that has caused all of those civilian sites to be struck. So, all military operations should be held responsible for a civilian site being destroyed. We, as simple people, need to stop putting up with it, and we need to to speak out against it. We have the we have our voices, we have our words, and we need to be telling our governments. That that's what should be used to settle disagreements between countries. Okay, so why don't we start with, um, let's start here in Canada with home heating oil. And let's listen to what uh, Mr. Povier has to say about the Liberal government and their carbon pricing. Aujourd'hui, Justin Trudeau a montré encore qu'il n'en vaut pas le coup. Il est, il est entré dans une coalition coûteuse avec les séparatistes afin d'imposer une taxe sur des Canadiens et de diviser notre pays. Justin Trudeau n'en vaut pas le coup, évidemment. Après huit ans, le taux d'inflation est le plus élevé que depuis 40 ans. Le, les taux d'intérêt augmentent plus rapidement que dans toute l'histoire de notre pays. Le coût de logement a doublé après huit ans de Justin Trudeau. Et à cause de sa, sa panique euh, au sein de le caucus libéral, il a reculé en enlevant temporairement une taxe sur une partie du pays tout en essayant de l'augmenter sur d'autres. Et maintenant, Les Canadiens vont devoir choisir entre la nourriture et le chauffage. On sait que le, les néo-démocrates ont été forcés de faire volte-face, malgré le fait que six députés néo-démocrates ont manqué le vote. Mais Justin Trudeau a été sauvé par des séparatistes qui sont arrivés ici afin de voter pour une augmentation de taxes sur le chauffage des Canadiens. Évidemment, Justin Trudeau est prêt à avoir une coalition avec le Bloc, ce qui est évident dans un article de la presse où le journaliste Joël Denis Bellevance révèle que des ministres libéraux ont confirmé une entente avec le Bloc québécois pour garder Justin Trudeau au pouvoir. Donc, c'est quoi les conditions de cette nouvelle coalition avec le Bloc québécois? Est-ce que le Bloc insiste pour une augmentation radicale des taxes et des impôts? Est-ce que le Bloc insiste pour augmenter les déficits inflationnistes? Quelle autre demande du Bloc est-ce que le premier ministre a accepté? C'est clair que Justin Trudeau n'en vaut pas le coup et ça coûte cher voter Bloc. Ça coûte très cher voter Bloc. Seulement le Parti conservateur a le gros bon sens d'annuler les deux taxes carbone et incluant celle qui 
s'applique au Québec. Seulement, le Parti conservateur a le gros bon sens pour équilibrer le budget et réduire les taux d'intérêt et l'inflation sur le dos des Québécois. Seulement, le Parti conservateur a le gros bon sens pour réduire les impôts et rendre le travail payant encore. Seulement, le Parti conservateur a le gros bon sens pour enlever la bureaucratie pour permettre la construction des maisons abordables. Seulement, le Parti conservateur va défendre ceux et celles qui travaillent fort. Euh, donc, c'est ça le choix dans les prochaines élections, ou bien une coalition coûteuse entre le Bloc et Justin Trudeau pour augmenter les taxes, enlever votre argent, doubler le coût de logement et rendre la vie plus dangereuse et coûteuse, ou bien le Parti conservateur guidé par le gros bon sens qui va permettre des gens de gagner des plus grands chèques de paie qui achètent des maisons de l'essence et de nourriture abordable dans les communautés sécuritaires. Thank you very much. And now in English. Justin Trudeau confirmed again today that he's not worth the cost. But what we learned is that he's now got a new carbon tax coalition with the separatists to divide our country. Given that the NDP was forced to flip-flop on Trudeau's plan to quadruple the tax, he had to find a new partner to keep him in power and avoid this non-confidence vote from passing. And who was there to save him? The separatists. Well, he's now signed on with the separatists to divide Canadians into two separate classes. Those who will have to pay carbon tax on their home heat and a small minority who will get a pause from the pain. All of Trudeau's MPs sold out their constituents and voted to make their home heating more expensive. Trudeau and his costly MPs have divided our country, raised our taxes, and pushed our people out into the cold. After eight years of Justin Trudeau, two million people, a record smashing two million people, had to go to the food bank in a single month. After eight years of Trudeau, we've had the worst inflation in, a, in four decades and the fastest rises in interest rates in monetary history. After eight years of Trudeau, housing costs have doubled and the share of an average paycheck required to make payments on an average home is higher than ever before. It now takes 25 years to, make, to, to, to save up for a down payment on an average Toronto home. It used to be you'd pay off a, an entire mortgage in that time period before Trudeau. And after eight years of Trudeau, you can now buy a 20-bedroom castle in Scotland for a lower price than a two-bedroom home in Kitchener. After eight years of Trudeau, criminals ask if they can stay in jail longer so that they don't have to get out and pay the rent in his housing hell. And to make matters worse, Trudeau wants to quadruple the carbon tax on your heat, gas, and groceries. So with today's vote, and with his hide and divide strategy, Justin Trudeau has set us up for the carbon tax election. We don't know when it will come, but it will happen. And it will be a simple choice between Justin Trudeau's plan to quadruple the tax on your heat, gas, and groceries, and my common sense plan to ax the tax and bring home lower prices. Thank you very much. Mr. Paul, yes, specifically on, you keep promising to ax the tax. I understand you want to ax the carbon tax on consumer, the side, consumer side. Can you clarify, would the Conservatives support a pollution price, a carbon price of any type on the industrial side? Well, the, the heavy industry does not pay the carbon tax. It only applies on, the fuel charge only applies on gas, uh, diesel, and, and, and home heating. And so we're going to ax the carbon tax. But would the Conservatives support pricing pollution on the industrial side our, as there is more. Our, our election platform will deal with all these issues. When will we when, do that? Uh, when, the elect, when the carbon tax election happens, yes. Monsieur Poilievre, Monsieur Poilievre, à part le vote d'aujourd'hui et, et, et à, part, euh, à part le vote d'aujourd'hui, qu'est-ce qui vous fait croire qu'une coalition avec le bloc et que l'entente avec le NPD, c'est chose du passé, qu'est-ce qui... Parce que là, vous dites, c'est soit nous, soit la, la coalition. Est-ce que vous questionnez la presse? La presse a confirmé qu'il y a eu une conversation entre les, les ministres libéraux et le Bloc pour garder Justin Trudeau au pouvoir pour deux ans. Ça, c'est une coalition. 
Est-ce que je ne vais pas accepter les attaques contre les médias? C'était dans les médias. Ça doit être vrai, non? Mais il y a aussi... Pourquoi est-ce qu'on continue, est est qu continue à dire que la taxe carbone s'applique au Québec oui, alors qu'elle ne s'applique pas et que le vrai. Québec a son propre règlement sur les combustibles fossiles? C'est pas vrai. Le, le, taxe, le deuxième taxe carbone s'applique au Québec. Euh, C'est clair. C'est pas, pas, pas un enjeu. Il n'y a même pas un débat là-dessus. Le deuxième taxe carbone s'applique au Québec. Il y a deux taxes carbone. Le premier qui s'applique aux provinces qui n'en ont pas leur, le, le leur. Mais il y a un deuxième qui s'applique dans toutes les provinces et tous les territoires. Et ça s'appelle le soi-disant règle pour des combustibles euh, verts. Et c'est une règle qui s'applique au Québec. Et selon le directeur parlementaire du budget, ça va augmenter le coût de l'essence et de diesel de 17 sous le litre. Et si on ajoute la taxe de vente sur la, ta la taxe carbone, ça va être 20 sous le litre. Donc, ça s'applique au Québec. Ça va s'appliquer sur le diesel, sur l'essence et indirectement sur tous les produits qui doivent être transportés ou réchauffés par euh, les énergies traditionnelles. Just keep saying that your party does not have a climate plan. Would a conservative government commit Canada to meeting the Paris targets? Our common sense plan uses technology and not taxes to bring down both emissions and the cost of living. We've already said we will green light green projects like small modular nuclear reactors, hydroelectric dams, uh, tidal, and wave, tidal wave power, and other emissions free energy that will lead to a massive boom in the clean energy that goes onto our grids and powers our future. We said we will speed up the approval of lithium, graphite, cobalt, and other mines that will be necessary for the electric future. That, that is only possible if you get government out of the way and speed up approvals to green light green projects. That's a common sense plan. The common sense plan. Will you sign on to the 2030 targets? Support the 2030 targets. The, well, let's, see, let's see how far off Justin Trudeau's carbon tax disaster is for meeting those targets, because so far, he hasn't met a single solitary target when it comes to greenhouse gas reduction. So we now know, by Justin Trudeau's own admission, that the carbon tax is not a climate plan. According to him, you can remove the carbon tax off oil heat and it won't hurt the environment. That's his argument. So now the question you have to ask is that after eight years in power, why is it that Justin Trudeau still doesn't have a plan to fight climate change? Thank you. So we're going to do a, a little format change, um, and I'm going to introduce the next segment, and we're going to um, be listening to uh, Antonio Guerrero's as he is speaking about the conditions in Gaza and how the UN is desperately trying to bring a ceasefire uh, and open corridors for humanitarian efforts so that people can get through. Now, keep in mind that this is not exactly work for the um, faint at heart. It is dangerous work that, that these UN um, humanitarian effort workers are are doing. Um, in in some cases they are subjected to firefights and uh, shellings and all sorts of other things that can happen to them and uh, some have it is in this conflict have there have been some casualties and deaths of uh, of United Nations humanitarian workers so why don't we listen to Tony Guerrero's next. A very good morning. The nightmare in Gaza is more than a humanitarian crisis. It is a crisis of humanity. The intensifying conflict is shaking the world, rattling the region, and most tragically, destroying so many innocent lives. Ground operations by the Israel Defense Forces and continued bombardment are hitting civilians, 
hospitals, refugee camps, mosques, church, and UN facilities, including shelters. No one is safe. At the same time, Hamas and other militants use civilians as human shields and continue to launch rockets indiscriminately towards Israel. I reiterate my utter condemnation of the abhorrent acts of terror perpetrated by Hamas on 7 October and repeat my call for the immediate, unconditional and safe release of hostages held in Gaza. Nothing can justify the deliberate torture, killing, injuring and kidnapping of civilians. The protection of civilians must be paramount. I'm deeply concerned about clear violations of international humanitarian law that we are witnessing. Let me be clear, no party to an armed conflict is above international humanitarian law. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, Gaza is becoming a graveyard for children. Hundreds of girls and boys are reportedly being killed or injured every day. More journalists have reportedly been killed over a four-week period than in any conflict in at least three decades. More United Nations aid workers have been killed than in any comparable period in the history of our organization. I salute all those who continue their life-saving work despite the overwhelming challenges and risks. And the unfolding catastrophe makes the need for a humanitarian ceasefire more urgent with every passing hour. The parties to the conflict, and indeed the international community, face an immediate and fundamental responsibility to stop the inhuman collective suffering and dramatically expand humanitarian aid to Gaza. Today, the United Nations and our partners are launching a 1.2 billion US dollars humanitarian appeal to help 2.7 million people, that's the entire population of the Gaza Strip, and of a million Palestinians in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Some life-saving aid is getting into Gaza from Egypt through the Rafa crossing. But the trickle of assistance does not meet the ocean of need. And let's be clear, the Rafa crossing alone does not have the capacity to process eight trucks at the scale required. Just over 400 trucks have crossed into Gaza over the past two weeks, compared with 500 a day before the conflict. And crucially, this does not include fuel. Without fuel, newborn babies in incubators and patients on life support will die. Water cannot be pumped or purified. Raw sewage could soon start gushing onto the streets further spreading disease. Trucks loaded with critical relief will be stranded. The way forward is clear. A humanitarian ceasefire now. All parties respecting all their obligations and the international humanitarian law now. This means the unconditional release of the hostages in Gaza now. The protection of civilians, hospitals, UN facilities, shelters and schools, now. More food, more water, more medicine, and of course fuel, entering Gaza safely, swiftly, and at the scale needed, now. And fettered access to deliver supplies to all people in need in Gaza, now. And the end of the use of civilians as human shields, now. None of these appeals should be conditional on the others. And for all of these, we need more funding now. In addition, I remain gravely concerned about rising violence and an expansion of the conflict. The occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, is at a boiling point. Let us also not forget the importance of addressing the risks of the conflict spilling over to the wider region. We are already witnessing a spiral of escalation from Lebanon and Syria to Iraq and Yemen. That escalation must stop. Cool heads and diplomatic efforts must prevail. Hateful rhetoric and provocative actions must cease. I am deeply troubled by the rise in anti-Semitism 
and anti-Muslim bigotry. Jewish and Muslim communities in many parts of the world are on high alert, fearing for their personal safety and security. Emotions are at a fever pitch. Tensions are running high. And the images of suffering are heartbreaking and soul-crushing. But we must find a way to hold on to our common humanity. I think of civilians in Gaza, the vast majority women and children, terrified by the relentless bombardment. I joined the UN family, family in mourning 89 of our UNRWA colleagues who have been killed in Gaza, many of them together with members of their family. They include teachers, school principals, doctors, engineers, guards, support staff, and a young woman named Mai. Mai did not let her muscular dystrophy or her wheelchair confine her dreams. She was a top student, became a software developer, and devoted her skills to working on information technology for UNRWA. I am so deeply inspired by her example. And I think of all those tortured and killed in Israel nearly one month ago, and the hostages abducted from their homes, their families, their friends, while simply living their lives. Ten days ago, I met with some of the family members of those hostages. I heard their stories, felt their anguish, and was deeply moved by their compassion. I will never relent in working for their immediate release. This is essential in itself and central to solving many other challenges. One mother movingly, movingly shared with me her desolation over her abducted son, Ersh. She also spoke outside the Security Council. And on the subject of confronting hatred, she said, and I quote, when you only get outraged when one side's babies are killed, then your moral compass is broken and your humanity is broken, end quote. Even in her utter despair, she stood before the world and reminded us, and I quote, in a competition of pain, there is never a winner, end quote. We must act now to find a way out of this brutal, awful, agonizing dead end of destruction. To help end the pain and suffering. To help heal the broken. And to help pave the way to peace, to a two-state solution with Israelis and Palestinians living in peace and security. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so the WHO... Um, is going to be focused more on uh, a lot on on what is happening in Gaza, but they are going to talk about other um, uh, global health conditions and happenings from around the world because that is what they do. They bring med medicines and medical treatments to uh, the most desperate of areas uh, so that hey, lives are saved. Uh, th through this particular organization. So why don't we listen to the, well, I guess the highlight of, of the day would be uh, the WHO um, press conference. Hello and welcome to WHO and today's um, press conference on global health issues, of course with a special focus on the escalating violence in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, it is Thursday, 2nd November of 2023 and we are here at WHHQ. Um, my name is Christian Lindmeyer and I'll walk you through today's press conference. Right for a start, we will not have translation available today, so we'll have to do this in English all the way through. Now let me introduce the panel of participants that we have here in the room. First and foremost, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, he's Director General of the WHO. Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for WHO's World Health Emergencies Program. Dr. Teresa Zakaria, she is the, um, the Senior Emergency 
uh, the incident manager for the escalating violence in the um, in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. And last but not least, Dr. Sylvie Mays, she's a senior emergency officer and we'll hear her here for any questions around Sudan. Now we have a uh, big list of colleagues online for the purpose today, and that's uh, first uh, Dr. Rick Brennan. He is the Regional Emergency Director in the Eastern Mediterranean region. We have the uh, head of WHO representative uh, from Egypt, Dr. Naima al Kassir. We have also the uh, WHO representative in the occupied Palestinian territories, Dr. Rick Peppercorn. And we have the WHO special representative for Israel, Dr. Michel Thierin. Welcome to all of you. And um, with this, let me hand over to the Director General for the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We're running out of words to describe the horror unfolding in Gaza. Since Hamas's horrific attacks on Israel on the 7th of October, more than 10,000 people have been killed, including more than 8,500 in Gaza and 1,400 in Israel. In both Israel and Gaza, 70 70 percent of those killed are women and children. More than 21,000 are injured and more than 1.4 million people in Gaza have been displaced. The situation on the ground in Gaza is indescribable. Hospitals crammed with the injured lying in corridors, morgues overflowing, doctors performing surgery without anesthesia, thousands of people seeking shelter from the bombardment, families crammed into overcrowded schools desperate for food and water, toilets overflowing and the risk of disease outbreaks spreading, and everywhere fear, death, destruction, loss. So far, WHO has verified 237 attacks on health care, including 218 in the occupied Palestinian territory and 19 in Israel. Attacks on health care are a violation of international humanitarian law. 14 out of 36 hospitals in the Gaza Strip are non-functional. However, Functionality is affected by lack of food and clean water and the lack of fuel to power generators. As health needs soar, our ability to meet those needs is plummeting. 23 hospitals have been ordered to evacuate in Gaza City and North Gaza. And forced evacuation in these circumstances would put the lives of hundreds of patients in a life-threatening situation. Moving a baby on life support would be hazardous in a high-income country. Doing so in Gaza would gravely endanger a child whose life has only just begun. And who knows nothing of this conflict, nor is responsible for it. Demanding these patients move puts them and the health workers in an impossible situation. And in most cases, they have nowhere to go. I send my appreciation to health workers in both Gaza and Israel who are dealing with the consequences of this conflict. The best way to support those health workers and the people they serve is to strengthen the existing health system by resupplying the hospitals and ensuring their security. In the past two weeks, WHO has been able to deliver 54 metric tons of humanitarian supplies to Gaza. But this does not even begin to address the scale of need. Far more is needed than can be delivered with a deep feed of aid, with a drip feed of aid. Before the 7th of October, 
An average of 500 trucks a day were crossing into Gaza with essential supplies. Since the 7th of October, only 217 trucks have entered in total. To sustain the humanitarian response on the scale needed, we need hundreds of trucks to enter Gaza every day. We thank Egypt for opening the Rafah border crossing to allow the evacuation of severely injured patients and foreign nationals. It's too late to help the dead now, but we can help the living. We can help those who live every moment in fear. We can help injured civilians. We can help the almost 200 women who are expected to deliver babies every day. We can help children and older people. We can help those with life-threatening diseases who need urgent medical care. WHO will do everything we can to ensure that all people in Gaza have access to life-saving health and humanitarian services. In the current situation, this is almost impossible. At the very least, we need a humanitarian pause in the fighting and ideally a ceasefire. We need unfettered access and safe passage agreed by both parties to ensure the security of access routes. Let me be clear, there can be no justification for Hamas's horrific attacks on Israel. I understand the grief, the anger, and the fear of the Israeli people. I also understand the grief, the anger, and the fear of the Palestinian people. WHO continues to call on Hamas to release the hostages it took many of whom need urgent medical attention. We continue to call on Israel to restore supplies of electricity, water, and fuel. We continue to call on both sides to abide by their obligations under international humanitarian law. And we call on who can, to, who can de-escalate this conflict rather than inflame it. With the world's attention is focused on Gaza and Israel, we are continuing to remind the world that we cannot forget Sudan. Since the conflict erupted in April, almost 6 million people have been displaced, including 4.6 million within Sudan. Combined with the more than 3 million people who were already displaced before the war, Sudan now has one of the largest numbers of internally displaced persons in the world. The already fragile health system is buckling under the load of injuries, outbreaks, malnutrition, and untreated cases of diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular, kidney, and respiratory diseases. In addition to measles, rubella, malaria, and dengue, outbreaks of cholera have been declared in three states. WHO is preparing to support cholera vaccination campaigns. More than 70% of health facilities in conflict hotspots are non-functional in conflict hotspots and in areas not directly affected by the conflict. Health facilities are overwhelmed with patients. Critical services have been discontinued in many areas, including for maternal and child care, severe acute malnutrition, and treatment of non-communicable diseases. Meanwhile, the health system itself continues to be attacked. So far, WHO has verified 60 attacks on health care since the start of the conflict, 
including the occupation of a pediatric center in Niala in South Darfur last week. We are pleased that the hospital staff have been released unharmed, but the pediatric center was looted and has had to suspend its operations. I thank all health workers in Sudan, most of whom have not been paid in six months, but continue to serve in the most difficult context. While talks between the parties to the conflict have resumed in Saudi Arabia, there is no sign of improvement on the ground. We call on the parties to implement the commitments they made in May this year. The late Kofi Annan said that suffering anywhere concerns people everywhere. The suffering of civilians in the occupied Palestinian territory, Israel and Sudan, and in so many other crises must concern all of us. WHO is doing everything it can to alleviate suffering in all of these places. But in each case, the ultimate solution is one thing we can't provide. Peace. Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. And with this, we're opening the line for questions and answers now. Um, let me remind you, in order to get into the queue for questions, please raise your hand with the raise your hand icon. Um, and we'll start with Jen Rigby, Jennifer Rigby from Reuters. Jen, please go ahead and unmute. Hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, the question is about Gaza. It's slightly two part. The first is, do you have any estimate for how many people have died in Gaza outside the bombings from the, the casualties from bombing? Um, and is there any kind of count of that from the authorities or from WHO? And also, who's the most vulnerable? Uh, and then the other question is, is WHO working with Israel to set up a field hospital in Gaza? Thank you very much, Jen. And I guess we go to Dr. Rick Pippercorn, uh, the WHO representative in the OPT. Rick. I, I didn't get the second part of the of the, the the question. I think the second part was on field hospitals. Is that correct? Okay, then I'm right. Um, let me first go to the the total number, and I think uh, Dr. Taylor has referred already to this staggering number. And unfortunately, uh, uh, we we got reports. I mean, the reports unfortunately has been increased. We talk now about eight thousand eight hundred five uh, deaths of which more than half uh, are women and children, and the injuries uh, over 22,250, including and also for the injuries over uh, half women and children. And the displacement was already mentioned of 1.4 million of the 2.1 million uh, gardens. Um, you asked about field hospitals and, 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 and maybe uh, we are uh, definitely, uh, we are currently not working on field hospitals, but maybe if I'm allowed, I could say something about the WHO uh, plans and the WHO operational response plan for the next uh, three months. Uh, so we are finalizing an, an operational response plan with an estimated budget of 50 million uh, for the next three months. And the focus is first and foremost, of supporting existing health facilities. So strengthen and maintain services and reinstitute a trauma pathway. We should not we should realize the health system in Gaza is incredibly resilient on the breaking point, but resilient. Uh, with, within this plan, we will focus of course on health service delivery, the management of casualties, the re-establishing of a trauma pathway from the point of injury and also maintaining the continuity of essential health services and the re-establish of referral pathway, primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. We focus on public health intelligence, early warning, disease prevention and control, supplies and logistics, and coordination. This is the core of the WHO operational plan. Then, to supplement it, 
we will focus on a number of emergency medical teams from outside Gaza to work with those key referral hospitals on, on certain areas where it's most uh, needed. We also will plan for two to three additional field hospitals uh, and ideally one in the north and two in the south. I want to make a very important point and people maybe don't realize that. There are approximately 20,000 health workers in Gaza. 20,000 health workers operational in Gaza. There are 7,084 physicians of which 529 surgeons. There are more than 11,600 nurses, almost 4,000 pharmacists, and 607 midwives. There's lab technicians, etc., etc. There is a, there was for this war a functioning health system. There are still from the 36 hospital, there's 22 hospitals operational, partly operational, I would say. And I think Dr. Tedros, uh, um, uh, they told Dr. Tedros, uh, already described all the, well, all the shortages, uh, which are, of course, affecting these current hospitals. There's also, when I look at the primary healthcare facilities, currently 26 of the 74 primary healthcare facilities are still partly functioning. Point I want to make, we will have to focus. We are now in an, I would say, ultra emergency phase. And, 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 and WHO is doing a lot to address that. I will not focus on that now. But in this humanitarian response, and when you look at health and the health system, we have to focus in supporting and making sure that the existing health systems, the existing health systems uh, will be able to deliver. It will be really a bit delusional if you think that with a few EMTs from outside or setting up a few hospitals that we can supply appropriate or even a minimum level of health services for 2.2 million Gazans. For that, and to have, of course, this plan to, to make sure it's operational, we need ideally a humanitarian ceasefire, but we definitely need safe passages, humanitarian corridors, and a sustained access to the needed supplies. Over to you, apologies for taking so much time. Thank you very much, Dr. Pippo. Can we go to Dr. Mike Ryan? And maybe if we can also, we have a question about the clarification, whether we said 15 or 50, five, one five or five zero, million for the operational plan, if we have that. No, I think 50, but... Uh, 50. Yeah. 15, one five. Dr. Ryan, please, for the other part. Five, zero, yeah. five. Okay, so now, not to confuse everybody, five, zero, 50 million for the operational plan, five, zero. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Paper. And now to Dr. Mike Ryan, please. I just want to reinforce the, the point that, uh, that uh, Rick made. Uh, the best and most effective and most rapid way to save lives is to support the existing system. Rick laid out the numbers to you there. The, the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the technicians, uh, the porters and everybody else within that system have done remarkable work over the last three weeks. They have saved countless lives. They want to continue doing that. The facilities are there, machinery is there, the beds are there, the operating theatres are there. It is the responsibility of all parties to the conflict to allow those hospitals to be resupplied. To it, the, the, the international law is clear on this. It's not just about not attacking facilities, it's about protecting facilities and occupying authorities have a special responsibility to ensure that such facilities are not only protected but serviced and supplied with the adequate needs for the populations that they serve. Um, the issue of uh, EMTs coming in in field hospitals, the best and most effective way to introduce an EMT or a field hospital is to bring it in an association with an existing facility where it adds to the number of beds. It adds specialist capability. It allows exhausted surgeons and others to rest while others take on the role. Putting field hospitals far away from population centers, uh, unsupported by the local infrastructure, is not the best way. It takes a long time. And secondly, right now, we have no deconfliction 
effectively operating. There is no humanitarian access, and anyone out there that says we've got humanitarian access, uh, uh, it, it is not true. Our supplies have been delivered in a way that I haven't seen uh, in the past. It has been almost impossible to set up appropriate notification, acknowledgement, and, and deconfliction measures in this particular conflict. So getting trucks over the border is one thing. Getting them to the places in which they are needed is another. And that has not been facilitated. That has not been supported. In fact, if anything, quite the opposite. So there is a huge gap between the rhetoric of some and the actual reality for our health workers on the ground and our staff on the ground. That needs to change. Because, uh, quite frankly, I'm sick of hearing all of these reassurances that don't actually exist on the ground for the people we work with. Our staff are operating under duress at the risk of their lives to help ordinary civilians working in ho and, and bringing supplies to hospitals. How are we going to bring in field hospitals with further international workers whom we can't even guarantee the basic safety of the staff we have on the ground now? This is unconscionable. This is unthinkable. And I've operated in many, many, many different crises in my time, many different situations. And we have never found it as difficult, never found it as difficult to establish the basic rules of engagement that would allow us to act in a proper humanitarian fashion with minimum guarantees of safety to our staff and to our partners. So the rules of this have got to change. If the international community want WHO and others to bring international staff and international field hospitals into Gaza, they must be able to guarantee their safety, and the occupying power must do likewise. There is no other way to do this. But as Rick said, the best way to do this is to support the existing system. But we will not be instrumentalized in this. We will not become a party to this. We are doctors, we are nurses, we are pharmacists, we are lab technicians, we are porters, we are drivers. Our job is to save lives. That is our only job. Thank you so much. With this, uh, to the next question, it goes to Ashley Furlong from Politico. Ashley, please unmute. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I wanted to know if you um, have the numbers for how many injured have been able to cross um, into into Egypt, um, and possibly also if you could try to set out how health workers decide who is who is transported and you know how you sort of triage those patients. It's obviously an impossible decision, um, and I wondered if if there's any um, the WHO has any sort of guidance on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. And for the first part, we start with Dr. Nima al Kassir. She's the WHO representative in Egypt. Nima, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. I would like to thank for this opportunity to answer your question directly. There has been a discussion on the most needed for in terms of trauma and medical evacuation. For people who need surgery, the burns, the ortho, orthopedic, and at the same time, people who are critical in terms of cardiac problems or thor thoracic injuries. And uh, this, this is one. Regarding the safe access, I would like to echo what Dr. Ryan said and also Director General. The, the, the movement of the patients has not been easy yesterday. We have the total number 46 that arrived. The hospitals, they were distributed between two main hospitals in uh, North Sinai. And at the same time, we know that they have been accompanied by 36 family members. Some of them have been only by one or a couple of two. The decision on who should be coming in and at the same time has been a consensus between several parties as we understand, especially between the Ministry of Health in the Palestinian territory and Ministry of Health in Egypt. This is the latest that we have. One of the critical aspects that there has been so many uh, more like 365 uh, international, some people call dual, some of them are international, that yesterday they have arrived and they have been safely checked at the border and passed. 35 children who were given their immunization at the board polio because of the fear. This is just quickly to answer this question. However, the concern is the movement has not been as easy. And already Dr. Mike Ryan said, it's not as easy as we think. You just open the door and the movement has happened. It started from 11 o'clock in the morning 
until 10 o'clock at night and it was trickling. And at the same time, very slow, as I understand. Now that I'm talking with you, I have one of the value Chukuli from country office at the border since 11 o'clock in the morning. And he said only three UN Italian passed and it was they were taken by the Rambas embassies and left no patient yet. Ministry was expecting patients since morning to come through. And this shows the complexity, the complexity allowing safe passage, humanitarian access, more importantly, ceasefire. There is a fear of movement by the patients, by their families. Very well put by Dr. Tedros and by Dr. Mike Ryan. If the children and critical care patients are on machineries to keep them alive, with this movement, they are being put at risk. Thanks so much, Dr. Garcia, and uh, to Dr. Mike Ryan, please. I just want to, um, to add a note of thanks, and Dr. Tedros mentioned this, but particularly to the, the Ministry of Health in Egypt and to uh, His Excellency, the, the Minister of Health, Dr. Khalid Abdul Ghaffar, because the work that's been done <clears throat> in Egypt over the last number of weeks uh, in terms of medical evacuation preparedness is has been truly state-of-the-art. While I was in Al Arish with Dr. Safan, the head of the hospital's directorate, we were able to, with, with Dr. With, uh, Naima, who's just spoken so so wonderfully, we were able to visit the Al Arish Hospital, we were able to visit the ambulance teams. There are 65 ambulances on standby with full resuscitation capability. There are 13 emergency physicians assigned to those ambulances for the most difficult cases. Their uh, Al Arish Hospital has full resuscitation capability, 30 ICU beds, 6 pediatric intensive care beds, and also has... Uh, um, Egypt has brought a number of specialist surgical teams in to work in that hospital, including burns, thoracic surgery, reconstructive surgery, plastic surgery, etc. There is a very um, intricate and, and, and well-worked uh, secondary layer of hospitals that have been identified to take patients on further referral. And the Ministry of Health have also built a stabilization and triage unit at the Rafa border. All the preparations are there on site. On the, on the Egyptian side, it is in place, it is highly professional, but as uh, Nima has outlined, the problem is getting safe passage for, for very scared patients and others in, in moving towards that border. Again, reflecting the terrible complexity uh, of the situation on the ground in Gaza. Thank you very much, both. Uh, next question goes to Ari Daniel from NPR. Ari, please go ahead and unmute. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess my, my question is around a report that the Foundation for Defense of Democracies put out, and they said that there's concern that Ashifa Hospital, which is the largest in Gaza, is, according to credible reports, a Hamas base of military operations. And I was just wondering, um, the, on the WHO's perspective around potentially disentangling um, the, the critical need for care in these hospitals and the potential complications of, of them being used as a base for military operations. And secondly, if there's time, I'm wondering about the, um, is there any, what sort of supports being offered for the mental health side of things in Gaza? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ari. Very different questions. And we'll start with Dr. Ryan on the Al Shifa first. Uh, yes, um, the the reality on the ground at Al Shifa and other hospitals is that we have thousands of health workers, thousands of uh, patients, probably hundreds of thousands of uh, civilians sheltering at these these multiple facilities, particularly all over, but but in the north now where they're where they're effectively cut off from from any assistance. Uh, the the rules uh, are clear on this. Uh, Healthcare must be protected. Uh, we have no information. We, I know what's going on above the ground. We know what's going on above the ground. We deal with the doctors, the nurses, and the administrators at that hospital and all of those hospitals. And they are crammed full of patients, ongoing operations, intensive care, and much, much else. Um, and in, in that context, we have no information on what may be happening elsewhere or underneath these facilities. That's not information we would have. It's not information we could verify. Uh, the the misuse of facilities and Dr. Tedros just outlined an example from from, from Sudan, uh, where uh, the misuse of facilities for for military purposes is equally outlawed under uh, under international law. The the difficulty here is 
separating the needs of 50,000 people, for example, at Al Shifa Hospital, civilians, doctors, patients, and others. We have no independent verification whatsoever of any of the information that you refer to. Um, and in this situation where such a, uh, an eventuality occurs, uh, again, it is the responsibility of the occupying uh, power to not only agree with the local health authorities on an evacuation, but then if that does happen, that has to be fully facilitated, fully supported logistically, and those patients, those doctors need to have a place of safety to go where the patients can receive an adequate and similar amount of care. None of those, none of those criteria are met. Those patients cannot be moved. Those doctors and nurses will not leave their patients. Uh, and all we know is that that is the situation above the ground in, in those facilities, and particularly at Al-Shifa. We have no knowledge of anything else to which you speak, uh, and no evidence, uh, likewise, that that, 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 uh, that assertion is, is true. There's lots of misinformation and disinformation in war. We're all subject to it. Uh, we're all victims of it. All we know is that we are supporting the thousands and thousands of patients, uh, civilians, and health workers who continue to try and deliver life-saving health care in hospital facilities all over Gaza. Thank you, Mr. Ryan, and for the question about the mental health uh, facilities or options, uh, we'll try and go with Dr. Rick Pepperkorn from the uh, Jerusalem Office for OPT. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to stress, first of all, mental health type social support is, is, is possibly and, and specifically in occupied Palestinian territory is, um, is one of the biggest needs. And, and specifically when you look at uh, Gaza, but also apply for the West Bank, East Jerusalem, etc. The, the many escalations, uh, crises, wars uh, they've gone through. Uh, the need has always, is always been tremendous. And, and currently, the, the mental, there is, uh, what I know, there's, there's actually one specific hospital uh, for mental health patients, which is still partly functional. Uh, but that's just a very small part of that. Uh, WHO, uh, um, in the past, we always have been supporting the whole area of mental health and psychosocial support and, 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 and uh, as to strengthen mental health and psychosocial support in primary health care and, and creating referral pathways, etc., at all levels. And we continue to do that. Actually, we were just starting with a new grant when this all, all happened. So we would focus on this, on, 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 on this again. At the moment, we talk, of course, about the mental health, psychosocial needs for, for many, many in Israel, and an enormous amount, I think everyone in Gaza, everyone in Gaza. Just yesterday, I just want to read, uh, we had an all-staff meeting with my teams in Gaza, and a lot of people were actually online. It was, of course, a very... Um, as you can imagine, a very um, trying and emotional meeting. Some of my staff is incredible. I think they're all incredible, but some of them are still fully operational, fully operational, risking their lives, risking their lives to make sure that essential supplies and medical supplies go to the hospitals and, and health facilities, to PRCS, to UNRWA facilities where it's most needed. WHO delivered, delivered already three times, three times, both to facilities in the north, facilities in the, in the south, with staff, my staff, risking their lives to do that. But I can tell you that and this is about UN staff, and people will argue, oh, they're even a bit more privileged than the other Gazans. There were only many of my staff, they were completely desperate utterly, utterly desperate and, and utterly depressed and, and, and no vision about life anymore. Well, this is a group of what we, a lot of people would call privileged staff. So think about uh, the rest of the Gazans and the Gazans, I mean, like being under, under blockade for the last 15 years, going to multiple escalations and, and wars, etc. So yeah, there's an enormous uh, need 
And this is just the population. I'm on direct contact with the health workers, with surgeons at various hospitals. Every day we try to exchange text and also my staff in Gaza is doing the same thing so that we can, we can, we can target the supplies as good as possible. The limited uh, supplies as, as Dr. Tedros were referring to. And many more uh, lined up. And we, of course, get also very disconcerting information about them, their mental health state of their the health of the, of the health workers. So, yeah, this is uh, one of the top priorities. And also in our three months plan is one of the key topics uh, as well to be addressed. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Papercon. For this, we also need to go to Dr. Michel Tirin, who's our special representative in Israel. Um, I'm sure he has a lot to add here. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Christian. On this side, it's a whole uh, shadow of trauma that is spreading across the countries, the survivors, the family of hostages, the witnesses of atrocities, the displaced population, the hosting communities of those uh, displaced people and survivors. I would even say the decision makers the whole country is plunged in a night of trauma, and the trauma spreads a bit like a virus. People, there is gradient of trauma with people that are put together. There are people who stay too long uh, in contact uh, with uh, with stories of others. It's 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 really an issue that must be stopped. The Ministry of Health has insisted on the urgency to restore a nationwide mental health resilience. And we have been uh, discussing this the whole day yesterday uh, with uh, health authorities in the presence of Dr. Hans Kluge, who came here also to, uh, to pay sympathy to those people who are traumatized. I think there is an urgent mental health collapse here in Israel, and uh, it will be uh, urgently addressed, and we are working on that on this side. Thank you very much, Dr. Thierry, and thanks to all of you. The very grim picture you're painting there. Um, next question goes to Gabriela Sotomayor from Progresso. Gabriela, please go ahead and unmute. Yes, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, I know that Gaza is, is a very important issue, but I have an issue, a question on, on Acapulco, Mexico. So on Wednesday, October 25th, a Category 5 hurricane left the port of Acapulco devastated. Nearly a million people live there, with 80% of all homes severely damaged. Several uh, severe uh, damage is also present in the, in the hospitals. There's still no access to water, food, medicines, electricity, and fuel is scarce. With the heat and bodies still under the rubble, this could lead to disease outbreaks such as cholera or dengue. Uh, the number of deaths are uh, at this moment 46, but a, a lot of people are looking for their loved ones. So my question is whether the government of Mexico has requested your assistance or your expertise in, man in managing these disasters, or if do you have any assessment of the state of the hospitals in Acapulco. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking my question. Thank you much, Gabriela. You're right. This is uh, easy to forget in the current crisis. I'm not sure we have anyone uh, here today who could who could talk about this. Um, maybe <coughs> Dr. Ryan can. No, try. we we will uh, we will come back to you on this. That Dr. Ciro Garte is a regional emergencies director, and I know that our team in in, in the Pan American Health Organization, the the Americans regional office for WHO are in close contact with the authorities in in Mexico and, and, and offering assistance. So I would have to update you later on the specifics of uh, what assistance has been requested and uh, what can be provided. But uh, again, our condolences and our hearts go out to people caught in these rapid onset natural disasters, which you know are becoming increasingly more unpredictable, increasingly more impactful and uh, they destroy lives all over the world. Um, climate change is here, the emergency is now, and uh, many people around the world are paying the price for our climate in action. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Ryan, and we said we'll, we'll connect you afterwards. Please get in touch. Um, 
Next question, I think it's a follow-up, goes to Jen Rigby, and I have a sense we forgot a part of your question before, so please go ahead and, and ask Jen. Not sure she, you're hearing us. Uh, in case not, but I, then let me ask what I think we forgot. I think we forgot the uh, percentage of other diseases, non-conflict related uh, injuries and diseases in Gaza, if we have figures about that. Not sure we have. Uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Dr. Teresa Zakaria, the incident manager, please. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, so I'll have to be honest, I don't have precise numbers for this. And I think this is where it's really important to understand that we need to go beyond these figures. They're, they're an indication as to how bad the situation is on the ground. And people may be dying because of complicated heart disease, but why does that person die in the end? It's because the person cannot access hospitals. Why? Because perhaps their neighborhoods was bombed. The road leading to the hospital was bombed. And so as such, we, it, is, it is unfair and it is not logic at this point to actually attribute the cause of death, whether it's been directly linked to bombardment or not. What we know for sure is that the population in Gaza are extremely suffering. And we see that just with the caseload, the, you know, the occupancy of all hospitals inside the, the entire strip. And that is extremely important and that is clear sign for us too that we need to do something about it. And yes, it, thousands, of, um, thousands of patients are already in hospitals beyond available beds. Hospitals are, are putting in place uh, a makeup beds and, and treatment options as well for people, but they are really at, at the verge of collapsing and that is extremely important to address. We, we just cannot allow the situation to go on for a, even another minute. Thank you. Thanks so much, Teresa. And I think Dr. Rick Pippercon also has his hand up. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, let me provide some, uh, some facts. Uh, we know, for example, there is a, a thousand patients in need for kidney dialysis. We know there's 130 premature babies in incubators. We know there's, on average, there's an, 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 an another every year 2,000 cancer patients, which of course are all at risk. Uh, we, we also know that pre-conflict, yeah, pre-conflict, that on average, 100 patients per day, they, they, would, they would actually be referred out of Gaza to East Jerusalem or the West Bank for their specialized healthcare. 100 patients per day. One, in four is a child. Most of them are oncology related. That's the biggest group. But of course, there's also specialization. So yes, of course, this, uh, this war, this conflict have an enormous impact. There's another 350,000 uh, estimated people who have non clinical diseases, think diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, of course, uh, cancer, oncology, etc., which are in need to get their insulin, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, we definitely have some uh, facts for that. And what we currently see, because I think there was also a question related to infections, et cetera, well, in the, in the shelters, we try to, together with, um, in all the, the shelter, UNRWA shelters and the makeshift shelters, uh, we try to with UNRWA to get a good assessment. We've seen a lot more acute respiratory infections among children. We see, of course, a more, much more diarrhea, and we see uh, skin diseases, uh, etc. Uh, the water sanitation in a number of these uh, shelters is really uh, problematic. So we really have to be able to better monitor for outbreaks and be ready for response. Over to you. Thank you very much. Also, uh, Dr. Papercorn again. Uh, we're coming to the hour, um, but I would like to give a last round of opportunity for our, our guests online here. Maybe we'll start with Dr. Rick Brennan, our Regional Emergency Director in the Middle Eastern region, in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Um, Dr. Brennan, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Christian. Um, Look, I, I think that um, uh, the Director General said it best. Our, our um, the needs in in Gaza right now are skyrocketing, while our ability to address those needs are, are plummeting. Uh, you've heard all the statistics from, from our colleagues. Uh, you've, uh, I think, we've tried to convey what that's like for 
an individual mother or child or father on the ground, um, particularly those crammed in these overcrowded settings now, um, over 700,000 people in, in schools um, and uh, overcrowding, difficult to get access to food, water. We hear these dramatic descriptions now of uh, of toilets overflowing and, and the risk of disease spreading. And then uh, that coupled with the constant bombardment, it's just a, a really toxic mix. So what you've heard from uh, from my colleagues is is exactly what we need. We need uh, uh, guaranteed access, secure access, protected access to those in need. We need to strengthen the existing health systems. Uh, the uh, the field hospitals, which we are consistently asked about, they will only uh, address a small proportion of the need. Uh, we need the access. We need it guaranteed. We need a major, major scaling up of the humanitarian assistance and the cross-border operation. Um, and most of all, we need the ceasefire that uh, the Director General uh, has called for. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Brennan. With this, we're coming to the end of it, and thank you all for your participation. Again, we will be sending the audio file and Dr. Tedros' remarks right after the press conference, and the full transcript will then be available later today or tomorrow morning. Um, for any further questions or follow-ups, please uh, write to media inquiries at who.int. And now we'll go for Dr. Tedros for the closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christian. And thank you to the members of the press for joining us today. And see you next time. I found this infographic, and it's, it was pretty simple. That um, I woke. That just imagine waking up one morning, you turning on the news, and you see that there is world peace. Um, that peace on Earth has actually happened, and there are no conflicts on planet Earth any longer. It's a wonderful dream and something that I think we all could strive to have. So thank you for listening. Please find that subscribe button wherever it may be. The show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.